Hello everybody and welcome to another video and today it is the 16th of September and I updated the map so that took a while but now it looks very nice so let's get into this we had a reported assault on Pravdine which occurred earlier today using tanks and infantry fighting vehicles but the VDV forces in this area were able to push them back using their artillery advantage so they were not able to make any breakthroughs over here. But presumably their goal in this area would be to first of all take Pravdine and then advance through these open fields and actually cut off the Russian troops maybe around Tomina Balka, Novodmitrivka, this area. And then they would actually be isolating Sofivka, Shiroka Balka, Stanislav, and Alexandrivka. So you actually have some Ukrainian maps which are very liberal in the sense that they're marking all this area as blue when in fact it's not but that's something that could occur in the future if ukraine were able to break through pravdine which they've tried to do several times now but each time they failed but i think they'll try again and we'll have to see if they actually succeed anyway over here in this andrivka bridgehead we just have the continuation of the drg forces uh, units operating over here doing their thing the situation is very fluid as i talked about previously and i would say now their goal is to reach this town over here called Berislav in order to cut off the communications between the northern part of the front and the southern part so we're gonna have to see if they actually reach this area it's not too far away about 19 miles i would say yeah 19 miles something like that so you can have some like recon operators that are able to break through and won't be spotted because they're in very small groups and they move around pretty quickly and actually reach very slav and sort of hinder with the infrastructure here and the communications that's something that you could look out for but this will all be complicated by the fact that the flooding has at least partially damaged some of the pontoon bridges there was one video of a pontoon bridge that was still operating but it was partially submerged but you could still have vehicles crossing over it for the time being at least because the flooding has not stopped the floods they reached like five meters in height and the head of the civilian administration in Dnipro he said that today the water levels decreased by 40 centimeters so there's still a long way to go in completely getting the situation back to normal but i will say that at least in the city of kriviri the situation is a bit better now because you have running tap water again the pump station was sort of damaged but now it's under control again now in this area over here in the northern front, you had an attack on Olhine by the 128th Brigade, which I talked about in a previous video, and a platoon from the 17th Brigade, which is consisting of tanks. So they tried breaking through, and similar to Pravdine, they failed, and were pushed back by the massive artillery barrage. But again, they will try to attack here again, and try to isolate the Russian forces in this area, because there is an opportunity, as I've talked about extensively, for an encirclement around here. But it is very unlikely at the moment. Let's look at Kriviri itself for a second, because this is actually very interesting. We have the city, which is a industrial hub. A lot of corporations operating in this southern sector with the quarries, which produce stuff such as cement and rare earth minerals and stuff like iron ore specifically and marginese so in regards to iron ore ukraine is actually the seventh largest producer of iron ore and the eighth largest producer of marginese and a lot of that actually comes from the quarries over here so the disruption of those quarries is certainly a problem for ukrainian industry although this is a temporary problem because the floods are predicted to be uh, subside at least over the next few days and fully get back to normal by about a week but for the time being it is a problem for 
Ukrainian industry in this area, and it is also threatened, of course, by a lot of shelling. You had Russia heavily shelling the industrial districts in recent days over here specifically, which is uh, around the center of the city. But something very interesting that was spread by locals living in the area is photos of the river that were actually um, in the color red. The river had actually turned red because it was intermixing with the iron ore and the marginese and maybe some acid waste. And so that sort of validates what I was saying about how the water would reach the quarry area. And this is sort of obvious just given the fact that the Inhulets district was the most affected. And look what's right next to the Inhulets district, all these quarries. So obviously they were affected by this and it created a blood-like color in the river which is pretty morbid but anyway this city is very important for ukraine as i said it before it actually makes up seven percent of ukraine's gdp and disrupting this will of course lead to some trouble for ukraine's economy and it already has for the past six months because kriviri is very close to the front lines there was even a point at which there were talks about the city falling. That was in early March. But now it's about like 27 miles away from the front line. Let's move on to one last thing from the Harrison region that I want to mention. You had a HIMARS strike on an, administra an administrative building in Harrison which led to one person being killed and another being injured. And five HIMARS shells were found. So this is a pretty big news because it's not the only attack that occurred within Russian controlled territory on what's not traditionally considered a military target, although you can bend the definitions for your own purposes. You also had attacks by either SBU or Partisans in Berdyansk over here, where the deputy head of the administration was killed along with his wife. And there was a car bombing in um, Luhansk, which killed the general prosecutor. So that's a pretty high-ranking position. And that's in addition to a lot of shelling that occurred yesterday at Veluki. You even had a civilian dying and the reason this is important is because it's a Russian citizen and that means that the war has sort of moved towards Russia itself and you actually have Russians starting to feel the the suffering from the war which could create some sort of political pressure in Russia and I will get into that at the end of the video. But anyway, let's move on to Zaporizhia, where you had Russia over the past days striking Nikopol with drones, but they also heavily shelled Maharnets and some of these other towns that were used as staging grounds to attack Enerhodar. You did have Ukraine trying to break through again at the Orykiv region, specifically with the 65th Brigade, where you had them tried to break through the positions of the 503rd guards motorized rifle brigade but as of now they've had no success in that regard let's move on to wherever there's actually some active movement because there's really no active movement in the donetsk area there was a reported russian assault in the Novobakhmutivka area but no real gains same thing in the Bakhmut area. You just have Wagner sort of trying to adva advance around here. They still haven't taken Odradivka, although I think that will happen very soon. And they're just assaulting Zaitseve now. That's uh, another key area. So let's move on now to the Donetsk front and the Kharkiv front. Because around here we don't have really much news. We don't have any reported changes from yesterday. We just had Spirni and Bilahorivka changing hands, but nothing much more than that. 
Ukraine did send more reinforcements towards their bridgehead just north of the Donetsk River over here. They were sending more recon units and more equipment in general. And they actually have approached Drobysheve. You had Russian channels reporting that fighting was actually occurring in the region, which does sort of imply that part of the national park, at least, is under Ukrainian control and they're operating in the area. But no successful breakthroughs yet on Liman. Heavy fighting was reported just south of Yampil. In the area around Sviatohirsk, it is sort of a gray zone right now. So this entire area is contested. All the forests to the north of Sviatogorsk. And Yarova is still under um, Russian control, but it is very tenuous. In Sosnove, you actually had a pro-Russian telegram channel, Slavyan Garad, report that it had fallen. But this is uh, unconfirmed. I'm still marking it as contested for now. But it would be a major breakthrough for Ukraine because there, then there would like be nothing in between them and reaching Alexandrivka. And then what would happen to Russia? They would be very exposed from the north and you could even have some sort of Ukrainian advance towards Liman from the north which would sort of create this two-pronged attack which would be very difficult to counter. You see Yarova obviously fall, Novoselivka, Derilove, many of these towns that were taken in April falling very quickly and it would just be a disaster. So Russia does have to put in some resources into this area to prevent the front line from breaking down again. There are still rumors that Sudanok was evacuated, but I don't really know how true this is. We don't actually know what's going on around here. So I'm keeping Sudanok as just black for now, not red or blue. Again, talks about DRG units in the forests over here just to the south of Oskiel, but no real firm data about whatever gains they've made just yet. The more interesting thing to talk about on this front is what happened at Kupiansk because we actually have a video from Ukraine and eastern Kupiansk. The vanguard of this attack was the Kraken Battalion, the infamous Nationalist Battalion, which really just fights around Kharkiv. They helped take Balaklia. They were one of the forced um, units to enter Balaklia over here. And now they're one of the first units to enter the eastern part of Kupiansk. So not all of Kupiansk has fallen. The pro-Russia map site, military maps, which I'm a big fan of, they showed that this rough area has been taken by Ukraine. But there are conflicting reports on the Russian side of things. Some are saying that th it was just recon units that were pushed out pretty quickly. And they're saying that the situation is also fluid over here because you still have Russian forces fighting in the area. They're not actually retreating. But the fighting is very fierce and they've probably made some losses today. So tomorrow is going to be interesting because we're going to see if Ukraine is able to actually solidify their gain over the rest of Kupiansk. Russia still does control the southern part of Kupiansk and some of the fields over here and the facilities to the far east, including this minor town, Kucherivka, and this other town over here, Petropavlivka. So those two can be used to create some counterattacks. Also, since a pontoon bridge was probably used to cross this area, or some sort of mechanism because the bridge was just destroyed. It could be possible that this is being treated like the Andrivka bridgehead where Russia will allow a lot of troops to be moved in before they actually close in on the pocket by destroying all the bridges and all the supply lines. So that's very interesting and maybe we'll see a repeat of what happened in Kherson. But... That will be in the future. Another thing to talk about is that a main Ukrainian goal is to take Barova. 
This is one of their main targets at the moment, and some maps actually show that this area has been taken by Ukraine, these forested areas just to the west of Borova. I don't know how true this is, but I want everybody to know in case there's some developments around here. But this would, of course, imply that they crossed the river and set up a bridgehead around here, which is very interesting. And again, this further confirms that Ukraine is poking holes in the Russian line and that they're going to have to at least have a backup line in case this one also breaks down. So, as I talked about yesterday, the Zarebets River is probably Russia's best choice because it's not as wide as the Oskil River, but still... It can be utilized to hold the line and you'd have, of course, a lot of rear guard units from the LPR assisting in this effort. So the line would look roughly like this. I'm going to color it in red. It would look a bit like this and then it would just follow the river. It would be pretty close to Zvatove. Just say eight or nine miles away from Svatove and if you send a lot of artillery to this area and deploy a lot of forces around here they would be outside the range of Ukrainian artillery and then they could obviously be moved in closer to prevent any sort of breakthroughs but it is good to have a backup line in case anything does happen so you might see that develop around here in this area of course so do look out for that. Anyway, let's look at the situation on the border between Belgorod and Kharkiv. We had Ukraine actually start to redeploy their forces towards Vovchansk, Vara, Varivka, and this other town of Volokivka. So now they're starting to just like deploy their forces around here and consolidate their gains so that's sort of the reason why ukraine hasn't been able to make such significant advances juxtaposed to what they did a few days ago because obviously they're consolidating the line and it's difficult to overrun the oskil river but yes they're now setting up firing points right next to the russian border and they're building up their positions around here and specifically the 14th mechanized brigade is being um operated in this area that I'm highlighting. They're even operating in some other towns further to the south, such as Berezniki, for instance, and Shevchenkove. And then they're just going to strike the Russian positions around here, because there are a lot of them, especially around Belgorod. You have a large grouping of Russian forces around here, a lot of battalion tactical groupings that could be targeted by artillery, high Mars whatever MLRS system is used, especially Shebekino, this is being struck a lot, and Valuki, where you had the civilian die, which might prompt some sort of response by Russia, um, because now they're just starting to realize the gravity of the situation, where you're going to have a lot of actual Russian citizens being targeted in the fighting, just because they're in the fog of the war, they're in what can sort of be considered the operational field of the artillery so that is worth noting and currently Putin he's in Uzbekistan meeting with Modi and Xi Jinping they're talking about numerous economic and political affairs so that's all very interesting that's not really the purpose of my channel but it is still interesting to look at but once Putin does return from this summit in Uzbekistan he will have to convene some emergency meetings and discuss the l latest unfoldings on the front line and sort of craft his response. So that's something I expect to happen once he gets back. I'm not sure when he gets back, but I'm pretty sure it's like today or tomorrow, something like that. And then you might see a new Russian response to the, first of all, gains in Kharkiv, but also to the strikes on the Kherson administrative building and some of the partisan or SBU attacks that led to the deaths of government officials. And it seems as if after what happened with the Inhul 
River Dam, you are starting to see Russia sort of take off its children's gloves and actually go all in in a way that they previously hadn't. And that might have wider implications for the entire war and for supplies in general. So that's very interesting, and we will have to keep an eye out for all of that. So thank you all for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow.